Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on CBS News. I'm Elaine Quijano. And I'm Michael George. Here's a quick look at some of the top stories we're following. The nation's employers added 209,000 jobs in the month of June. The number is slightly below expectations, but most experts say it's high enough for the Federal Reserve to resume interest rate hikes when it meets next month. Baltimore police say they've arrested a 17-year-old in connection to Sunday's deadly block party shooting. He's facing several charges, including assault weapon possession. Sunday's shooting killed two people and left 28 others, including children, injured. Fire burns for a third day aboard a cargo ship carrying 1,000 cars at a port in Newark, New Jersey. Officials say the gasoline in the tanks is making it hard for crews to battle the flames. The fires already claim the lives of two veteran firefighters. Well, UPS workers are getting closer to striking as union negotiations stall with the company. The potential strike could have devastating impacts on the nation's economy. As many as 340,000 full-time and part-time drivers, loaders, and package handlers could walk off the job beginning on August 1st. While both sides say there was progress while accusing the other side of walking away from the table during negotiations. The union is working to secure higher pay along with more full-time jobs for its workers. It is also looking to remove surveillance cameras from its delivery trucks and same page for all employees who do the same job. CBS News senior national correspondent Mark Strassman joins us now. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, first off, I want to get a sense of why the talks have broken down between the U UPS and the Teamsters. Well, let me give you a sense, Michael, first of the playing field here. If you're a UPS employee and you touch a package, you're a Teamster. As you mentioned, 340,000 folks here in the U.S., that's a, obviously a significant chunk of people, and it's by far the biggest uh, block of uh, employees that uh, are also happen to be in the Teamster. So there's a lot at stake uh, for, for both sides here. They've been negotiating for months, uh, and, and I should also tell you that like being a UPS driver is a good gig. I mean, 95000 a year, plus free health care and a pension, a pension in 2023. But, the, but UPS is also a very profitable corporation. Teamsters want more uh, for their employees, uh, part of those profits. And now each side is accusing the other of, uh, of walking away from the table. And that, of course, is an issue. The deadline is July 31st. Um, and because UPS essentially delivers roughly 19 million packages, uh, five, five or five and a half days of the week, um, there is going to be potentially a significant disruption to how we all do business, whether you get an Amazon package or whether you're in the supply chain somehow. And that, of course, is what all of us are keeping an eye on. Yeah, I wanted to dig into that. I mean, what kind of impacts could that potentially have on the nation's supply chain? Okay, so Elaine, you, you're at home and you order a package and, you know, from Amazon, say, and you, you, know, you, you want that package to come in. So you know, all of us who do that, could feel it, number one. Mm -hmm. Then on the supply chain, um, I mean, like, let's just take auto parts, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, uh, if, if a car dealership can't get the parts that it needs to do the repairs on my car or your car, that's going to be disruptive. And when you think about the capacity of this market, I mean, 19 million packages a day, it's not like it's automatically, uh, it, it, it's automatically could be filled by, say, DHL or FedEx. It's not that simple. I mean, there's bound to be disruption. And so there really is a lot on the line here. It's not as though, as I say, just because UPS is out of the picture, I'll just take my business someplace else. There's a big question mark about whether uh, someplace else exists to handle all 19 million packages a day. Well, Mark, you make a good point because there are so many businesses out there that rely on the mail to send products, buy products. Uh, so if we do get to that point, and nobody can tell how this is going to play out, but if we do get to the point where there's a strike, what does that mean for the overall economy? Could this have a big impact on the U.S. economy as a whole? Well, look, what have we been talking about for the last, you know, year or two, we're talking about, talking about supply chain issues and inflation, right? And just as this economy seems to be doing better, along comes a potentially disruptive influence like a UPS strike. I mean, none of this is, uh, is, is healthy for the economy, obviously, just because UPS is such a big player. And so it really is in everybody's interest if these two sides can, can get, get back to the table, uh, hammer this out, avoid the work stoppage. Of course, the big question is, can they do that? I feel like that 
constant flow of traffic of people in and out with packages behind you, Mark, just underscores, you know, yeah. that number, 19 million. Imagine. It's just no hard question. to imagine yeah, how that no would be picked question. up. Well, Mark Strassman, yeah, thanks no so much for joining us. Just, just we've been standing here, people going in and out. You bet, guys. Sure. While most of us may be focusing on summer fun right now, health officials are already working on a plan to prevent a repeat of last winter's triple-demic of respiratory illnesses. The plan involves vaccines, and this year the CDC is recommending three of them, one for COVID, the flu, and a new one for RSV. This comes after last winter saw some 58,000 deaths from the flu during the peak season, while roughly 50,000 died from COVID between November 22 and March 2023, and 10,000 from RSV, which also saw more than double the number of hospitalizations. Health officials say the three shots will greatly help lower those numbers, but there are some concerns. Let's bring in Dr. William Schaffner. He is a professor of infectious diseases at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Schaffner, welcome. So how did these respiratory illnesses become so virulent last year? Well, Elaine, what happened probably is that before then, we were all locked down, wearing masks, children staying home from school, and we reversed all that, right? Mm. We were protected from the viruses by all those lockdowns, and then we opened things up, took off our masks, sent the kids back to school, and the viruses had an opportunity to spread. And they did last year. Mm. They started early, they started vigorously, and there were three of those viruses active, those respiratory viruses at the same time, flu, COVID, and this other virus that people are just hearing about, RSV. Uh, Dr. Schaffner, when we talk about these three, can you take all three vaccines at once, flu, COVID, and RSV? Uh, Michael, I don't think too many people will want to do that. I will tell you that flu and COVID are well studied. They work well together. RSV and flu, it resulted in a somewhat diminished response on the flu side. So I think RSV probably ought to be taken alone, separate from the other two. Well, we know, doctor, that generally the vaccines are especially important for seniors and people with underlying health conditions. Are there some groups that should not get the shots, or at least not all three of them? Well, so far, RSV is recommended with discussion with your doctor for people age 60 and older. So we can put RSV aside for that group. Other than that, I think COVID and influenza vaccine will be both widely recommended. We know influenza's vaccine is already recommended for everyone six months of age and older. And the recommendations for the new COVID booster that we anticipate this fall, they'll be coming soon. And they'll probably also be rather widely recommended. And, Doctor, talking about COVID, do we have any information yet on how resistant the latest COVID mutation is? Well, so far, fortunately, you see my fingers are crossed. <laughs> These COVID variants that are showing up are all related to the Omicron family. Mm. And they should be covered by this new vaccine that is going to be available this fall. Interesting. All right, Dr. Schaffner, while we have you here, the FDA has just given full approval for the Alzheimer's drug, Lakembi, but there are concerns about the medication. What can you tell us about that? Well, let's applaud first. This is an advance for Alzheimer's. This is an area in which we have waited for scientific breakthroughs. So it looks as though we have a medication that can at least slow down the pro progress of Alzheimer's. But on the other hand, we need to have some cautions. You can be get an adverse effect of brain swelling, which is obviously not a good thing. And this medicine is not easy to receive. You'll need two infusions, IV infusions, every month. So let's see how it works out in practice. But uh, in the beginning, applaud. We're moving in the right direction. Science is helping us combat Alzheimer's. Cautious optimism it is. Dr. William Schaffner, doctor, always great to have you. Thank you. My pleasure. We're going to take a short break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News Always On.
some vehicle makers have reached a deal with California to phase out diesel big rigs. Washington Post climate correspondent Timothy Puka spoke with CBS News about the state's plan to transition to electric commercial trucks. Tim, what more can you tell us about this deal in California to phase out those diesel big rigs? Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty big step. California has been pushing for new, more stringent rules for trucks. As you alluded to, they're a huge source of pollution in the transportation sector. Uh, we've seen electrification take over uh, across vehicles of all types. And, and California's position, and backed up by a lot of environmental groups, is that the technology is far enough along um, that, that these trucks exist and that government, because of the imperative of climate change, should push the industry um, towards adopting them as much as possible. So um, California earlier this year uh, approved a ban on sales of new uh, diesel big rigs uh, starting in 2036. And, and part of this deal, there's some regulatory stuff, but the real big headline move is that the, the, the big engine and, and truck manufacturers are going to support it. They're going to be ready in 2036 in, in California. And Probably a few other states, we'll see about this, to, to have only uh, electric or, or maybe hydrogen sales, no more conventional engines. Hydrogen is really interesting. We don't talk a lot about it. So I have an electric car, and here's one thing that I learned. A, electric vehicles are expensive. B, it takes an awful long time to charge your car. You have to factor in that time. And you need infrastructure, you need chargers. So I'm wondering if that's also part of the conversation. Are they gonna start to kind of like put together a countrywide charging kind of setup for these big rigs? Yes, there's been a lot of the money approved by Congress to do that, the, the, the president, White House, uh, Democrats in DC especially, but with some help here and there from Republicans have, have helped push for a lot of money uh, to expand charging networks nationwide. California, one of the reasons that they're a leader in, in, in rule makings like this and in deal makings with the, the, uh, the auto industry is that California already has a lot of that. EV adoption has been faster in California than in other states. If you drive around in California, you'll see chargers of all types everywhere. Um, the other thing that's happening is that um, the, the charge times that you're talking about, mm -hmm. they're highly variable and, and they're improving a lot. There's a lot of technology out there to, to get these charges done faster. And, and yes, I think that the important point here is for everyone, just not just Californians, is that if something like this is going to have to happen nationally, the trucking industry says they're ready to do it, but they need more of the infrastructure that you're talking about, and they want even more federal support to make it happen. And just to clarify, it is a ban on selling diesel-powered trucks in California come 2036. It's not that diesel-powered trucks like big, these big rigs are going to be banned on the streets of California. Yeah. It's just you can't sell them anymore within the borders of the state. That's right. Regulators have recognized that there's typically a need for a phase in. You can't just get right. rid of all the trucks at once. Um, I, I believe by the 2040s, though, the plan is to start doing that to make sure that that you know, after you know 20 years of lead time, that then, yes, eventually um, the only thing on the road is, are, are zero emission trucks. I know that uh, initially there was pushback from the industry and part of their argument was, you know, if you do this, people will just hang on to their diesel trucks longer right. and, and that will be counterproductive because you'll have many filthy diesel trucks belching out bad things into the air. What made them come around? Well, it is a tricky thing. A lot of these engines, especially for like the long haul rigs that we're talking about, they're they're built to last forever. They're built to be rebuilt, to be fine tuned over time. Uh, and so, um, part of what California has done here is use its regulatory power to push the industry to 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 to, to break out of that cycle and to actually adopt you know all new trucks, all new technology. California has special provisions. Um, in the Clean Air Act because they were doing environmental regulation even before the federal government was. And so under that, under those special provisions, um, they often get permission from Washington, they, they can do this, it's written in the law, to have rules that are more stringent than what Washington is requiring for the rest of the country. And there are a lot of other typically liberal leaning states that will have the power also to adopt whatever rules California has. So California has used that power to kind of say, well, hey, we're gonna make even stronger rules. The trucking industry, what they want the least and this is true for many automakers, is different rules in California from different rules of the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. And if they know California is heading in one direction, 
California can kind of push them. Well, let's, you know, let's make a deal. California is giving up things here. There will be um, some lighter regulations that, that they'll adopt as part of this, very, mostly very technical stuff. And so by, you know, by doing that, by having some give, by giving into a full national standard in some of the finer regulations, then the trucking industry said, okay, we'll do a deal with you and we can commit to this bigger picture thing. It's really interesting. You know, it's like, like you pointed out, Tim, at California, so goes California, so goes the rest oh, of the country. The country. Um, right. And they have been successful in pushing for regulations on many fronts that helps uh, the environment. Also, you know, Port of Los Angeles, the busiest port in the country, they deal with a lot of trucks. So they have, you know, a particular reason to want to rein this in. Yeah. Um, Tim Pugo, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. So travel companies are now integrating AI technologies into their platforms to assist travelers to plan their next vacation. Editor-in-chief for Entrepreneur Magazine, Jason Pfeiffer, joined Ed and Anne-Marie earlier to discuss. And this is surely an entrepreneurial thing, but yeah. it could put some entrepreneurs out of business, too. So explain to us how this works and if it has any limitations. Well, it could put some entrepreneurs out of business. It could also create some new entrepreneurs. So let me start with an example. I am currently on vacation in Boulder, Colorado. And so last night I went on to ChatGPT and I said, my wife is a food snob, which is true. She would admit it herself. I said, my wife is a food snob. Where can I take her for a nice restaurant date night? in Boulder, Colorado. It came back with six options immediately. I showed them to my wife. She said, not bad. Mm. And this is just the beginning. These tools can create entire itineraries for you. And that's the reason why the industry is so interested and they're starting to integrate ChatGPT. There are a lot of startups doing this, but also big players like Expedia are creating chatbots that you can use to plan your next trip. So that's a very interesting use um, of AI. I was telling Ed that for our spring break trip, I actually went through three sort of the three options that are available. We planned it ourselves, but then we also hired a, a travel agent. And then I also found this app that was an AI app to plan an itinerary for me. And ultimately we ended up scrapping the travel agent and the AI app didn't really do it for me because part of the joy of getting ready for a vacation is the weeks and weeks of planning for me. <laughs> um, so I like doing that work. I wanna ask you, why would someone choose to use AI to plan your vacation? Well, it's efficient. And let's be clear, nobody, including people who make artificial intelligence tools, is saying that this is the only thing that you need or that this is right. going to replace everything. Instead, it's a great tool. You should think of ChatGPT like the microwave in your kitchen, which is to say it's incredibly impressive technology. It can make some things very fast, but you don't make gourmet meals with it and you don't do everything with it. Mm. And that's the case with this. So it's fun to play around, for example, with the prompts. You know, if you type in, show me some family friendly vacation ideas in Boulder, Colorado, you're going to get a whole bunch of random stuff. But if you start to be incredibly specific, I have two boys, ages eight and four, and they're very energetic and they like to run around. Where can I take them in Boulder, Colorado? You might get some good starting points and then you can use those starting points to do your own research and talk to people and do all the things that are really fun when you're planning travel right so it takes the grunt work out of it and then you just left with you're left with the fun stuff yeah i like, I like that. that microwave analogy though. yeah that's a good way of explaining how all of this ai technology could ultimately uh help all of us in one way or another at least in the good ways mm -hmm. there have been of course a lot of delays and cancellations lately Jason, uh, because of weather, because of staffing issues across the airline industry. Is there any AI technology yet that's helping actually assist in rescheduling either travel or vacation plans? Well, that stuff is starting to come online. The main thing that people are using, which is ChatGPT, is very literally far behind because it has a knowledge cutoff. It doesn't know things after September of 2021. So that's certainly not the place where you're going to go to get the latest information on how to get out of a travel jam. But there are certainly tools that are going to help you identify the right carriers or maybe something to do when you're stuck in Atlanta and you don't know where else to go. But this is the kind of stuff that's coming. These are very early days. And you right. know, you said at the beginning of the segment that there are opportunities opportunities for entrepreneurs. And I would say there are a lot of people thinking about how to create solutions for just that. And I was, that, my follow-up question to you was, where do you see this going? Yeah, it's early days, but you know, what's next? 
Yeah, well, so a lot of people are predicting that this kind of stuff is going to put people out of work, and I just don't see that to be true. People have predicted the end of travel agents since the beginning of the That's internet, true. and they're still here, and they're still very useful. And the reason for that is because although we often think of new technologies as replacing humans and jobs, that's not actually what happens. Instead, what happens is that it changes jobs and it creates new opportunities. So you could imagine a world in which artificial intelligence makes travel more efficient to plan. And because it's more efficient, it becomes cheaper. And because it's cheaper, more people start traveling. And because more people start traveling, you need more jobs to serve the people who are traveling. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're going to see some changes in the industry, but I don't think that it's doom and gloom. I think that it's a lot of opportunity. I like that uh, glass is half full I do too. perspective, my friend. Jason Pfeiffer, thank you very much. That's the entrepreneurial spirit. I appreciate <laughs> you having so me. It's so true. Exactly. Coming up at CBS News Weekender, health officials have confirmed seven new cases of locally acquired malaria in Florida and Texas. So how worried should you be about contracting the disease? A doctor joins to answer that question and more. Plus, from taking tests to creating art and music, we've talked a lot about artificial intelligence on the stream, but how is it affecting the dating scene? Take a closer look. CBS News Weekender is next. You're streaming CBS News.